أشوف الحتة اللي هي أقل ممكن حط خشبة؟ حط خشبة بس يا ابني The face of Yuya, courtier, priest, father of a queen, and perhaps the grandfather of a pharaoh, Tutankhamun. For three and a half thousand years, Yuya has lain in his golden coffin, waiting to be reborn into the afterlife. Instead, this morning, Yuya has a visitor from Liverpool. Yeah, I think somewhere you've got the, the length of the metacarpals. Ronald Harrison, professor of anatomy at Liverpool University. For the professor, Yuya is vital evidence in a medical detective story which has brought him to the mummy room of Cairo Museum. Using the most advanced post-mortem techniques, Professor Harrison and his team hope to establish new facts about the pharaohs who ruled Egypt 14 centuries before the birth of Christ. But most of all, they want to solve a long-standing domestic problem. Who was Tutankhamun's mother? In identifying human remains at home, uh, one has a great deal of information to go on. Usually the police are able to provide one with all sorts of data about where the person lived and what he did during his life, or what they presumed that he did during his life. And of course, the very area in which a person is found will tell one a great deal about him. But here, um, there's very little evidence and as a result one has to base one's conclusions entirely upon scientific data and one has to bring to bear every possible scientific analysis it's a much greater challenge for professor harrison it's a challenge which will involve sophisticated techniques pioneered in the laboratories of liverpool university but for tutankhamun's grandfather it must mean a disappointing undignified sort of awakening and he'd find that a lot of Egypt's sacred past isn't quite as he left it. Wonderful! Super duper! Like a horse. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, oh, you made it! Very much both cars to fly. Oh, marvellous. The only thing is the um, arrows. One thing to be asked for the world of fly. And then he sold me a camel for ten bucks. <laughs> <laughs> he gave me the face. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> That's English. No, 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 no. I keep giving you other ones. <laughs> That's English. Yes, it's well, English. English. <laughs> I'm just astounded. I just don't know. I'm sorry, pinching myself. So, no, I've never been fun. such in all my life. If I never see one again, it'll be too bloody soon. <laughs> um, in a hurry now to get back to Alexandria. Yeah. See you later, Alexandria. <laughs> Come on up. Come on up. No chance for us. The proud driver told us his ship of the desert was called Cadillac. But the miracle of ancient Egypt, which has been a tourist trap for more than 20 centuries, and which tugged at Professor Harrison 3,000 miles away, is nothing if not resilient. And each sunset, when the last tourist bus has gone, when even the slide seller is about to call it a day, the wonder is somehow reborn. After 5,000 years, this is one scene which can live up to the Hollywood splendors of the nightly sans et lumière. You have come tonight to the most fabulous and celebrated place in the world. Here on the plateau of Gizeh stands forever the mightiest of human achievements. The curtain of night is about to rise and disclose the stage on which the drama of a civilization took place. Pyramid on Earth. 
Nothing like it had ever appeared before. And when the peasants in the fields below looked up and saw it, pointing the way to heaven, they knew they were indeed ruled by gods. Here at Saqqara, almost 5,000 years ago, the vizier Imhotep built this for his pharaoh. It was to be a house of eternity in a great city of the dead. Cities for the living were built of brick and wood. This home of the soul was made in stone to endure the passage of a mortal time that its dead no longer knew. And this place once hid the ancestors of the shriveled nobility who'd become an obsession for Professor Harrison. In the heart of the steppe pyramid, within a maze of galleries, Imhotep built a tomb to hold the body of his king until the day it rejoined his spirit. Today, the first great stone building on earth stands firm. But the king is gone, long ago the victim of tomb robbers. But there is one part of Saqqara which has eluded the tomb robbers and even the tourists. For 2,000 years, no one saw this place. Buried in Roman times, it was lost under 20 centuries of sand. As the archaeologists dug down in the 1960s, they found this was the tomb of Nefer, the high priest, and also improbably the royal hairdresser. But buried deep under the floor of the tomb, they found something infinitely rarer. From a darkness which has lasted almost 5,000 years, a kilowatt of television light stares at the perfectly preserved body of a man, the high priest Nefer himself. This is the oldest complete mummy ever found in Egypt. And this, of course, is where Professor Harrison comes in, although his first mummy had a rather less romantic resting place. There was a unique case in Rill of a body that was placed in a cupboard uh, which actually became mummified. Now, this made me very interested, first of all, in the process of mummification. Well, I mean, that was real and this is Cairo. Yes, I know. Uh, in 1963, because I'd been involved in this investigation of, of the real mummy, they thought that probably I'd be the best person to investigate um, a skeleton which is in the museum here and which a lot of Egyptologists had been worried about for some time. This was the troublesome skeleton, thought by many experts to be the rather dilapidated remains of the pharaoh Akhenaten. Using his scientific techniques for the first time, Professor Harrison was able to establish that this was in fact Tutankhamun's brother, Smenkare. So, science had unscrambled a rather messy bit of history. You see, like so many of these things, uh, Egyptologically, there's a great deal of hearsay evidence, a great deal of second-hand evidence from association of two figures on a coffin lid, for example. And in the case of um, some coffins, of course, there may be the name of the occupant of the coffin on the lid. But sometimes um, bodies have been switched from one coffin to another and names have been removed from other coffin lids and so on. So sometimes it's very difficult to determine the identity of a given body, and there are quite a few of them in the Cairo Museum here. So, it was about time that scientific methods were brought to bear upon this identification business. The 1963 expedition was followed up by another one in 1968, in which we looked at 
the remains of Tutankhamun. And this in turn has opened up a whole new investigation of uh, the interrelationships of pharaohs in the 18th dynasty. The problem of relationships and just who was what to whom at the time of Tutankhamun is why Professor Harrison has come to Egypt. It's a tangle which has understandably baffled even the most imaginative students of family life in the 18th dynasty. In a very simplified form, and only as far as our story is concerned, it all starts with Yuya. Around about 1400 BC, he was a high court official who married Suyu. They had a daughter, T. And for a commoner, T made an excellent marriage. She caught the eye of the pharaoh himself, Amenophis III. They had a happy marriage, blessed with a stream of children, including Pharaoh Akhenaton and a daughter called Sitamun. But this is where it stops being just another heartwarming family story, for next, Sitamun married her own father, Amenophis III. It was a common enough event at a time when a pharaoh was always anxious to preserve the family line, but it was extremely inconvenient for people 3,000 years later trying to sort out their family tree. Most of the confusion is centered on the problem of the brothers Smenkare and Tutankhamun. Both are now believed to be the children of Amenophis III, but who was their mother? Was it Queen T, or was it their own half-sister, Sitamun? Enter Professor Harrison. It so happens in the museum, there is the body of Amenophis III. Um, there are also the remains of the parents of Queen T. If, therefore, we can investigate these three people anthropometrically and also possibly remove tissue from them to investigate the blood groups of these three people, and we already know the blood groups of Smenkare and Tutankhamun, we can get a very good idea of the genealogy of the pharaohs of the 18th dynasty. So you can sort out another argument. That's right. Yes, I hope so. I mean, one would have thought that a 20-year-old mummy was a lot easier to identify than a mummy which is, what, 3,000 years old? One would think so, but it's, it's astonishing just how much of the form and tissues of the body are preserved over this very long time. If one examines any pharaonic remains, provided the bandages in which they were originally wrapped have not been removed for a very long time, the state of preservation is quite fantastic. But why did the ancient Egyptians go to such extreme length to preserve their kings and queens? The basic reason is still there, a few yards from the Cairo Museum, a lot dirtier, but still very much alive. Without the Nile, there could be no Egypt only desert. But once the immortality of the god Pharaoh was secured by magic and mummification, he could actually become the god Osiris, custodian of crops and creator of the annual life-giving flooding of the Nile. The heretic Pharaoh Akhenaten tried to convert his country to the worship of a single god, Re, god of the sun. But even his hymn to Re was filled with rapture for the river he called the heavenly Nile. living sun, when you sleep in the west, beneath the horizon, the earth is plunged in a shadow that resembles the shadow of death. But when the dawn comes, you glitter on the horizon. When day breaks, you chase away the black shades. The two lands awake rejoicing. The whole world then begins to go about its business. The cattle champ their fodder contentedly, trees and plants open their leaves, 
and birds forsake their nests, spreading their wings in adoration of your soul. Boats are able to sail up and down the great river. Your light illumines the highways and byways. Your rays provide food for the fields, and when you smile, they flourish and become fruitful for you. You have created millions of things, towns and cities, fields, rivers and roads. How numerous are your works, and how mysterious to our mortal eyes. Day sun, mighty in power, you have brought life to the most distant countries and given them a heavenly Nile to shed its waters upon them, to inundate their slopes with its ripples, to irrigate the fields between the villages. All the mortals who have been on earth since the beginning of time have been brought up to honor your son, issue of your flesh, Pharaoh of the two Egypts. The Cairo Museum, where most of the movable bits of ancient Egypt have found a new home. The museum is also the resting place for the three mummies, which are the central clues in Professor Harrison's search. Although you'd hardly guess it from the Victorian showcases and the gloomy corridors, the Cairo Museum is also one of the world's great treasure houses and in the unlit recesses of the first floor, behind glass stamped with the fingerprints of countless tourists, are some of the most fabulous objects on earth, over a thousand of the treasures that never reached Britain from the tomb of the pharaoh Tutankhamun. But while Tutankhamun rests safe behind glass, Professor Harrison is already at work with his supposed grandfather, Yuya. Now the problem is going to be whether we are going to be able to put uh, X-ray film underneath the body. No, no. no. only underneath here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right at the beginning of his first examination, the professor has struck a problem. Now that the fragile coffin lid has been lifted away, the museum authorities are suddenly reluctant to disturb Yuya further by moving the body itself or by placing X-ray plates inside the coffin. 
but for the professor, Yuya's comfort must limit his investigation. Dr. Riyad, it will be impossible to put x-rays underneath the mummy in the coffin. I will have to put... Well, how? X-ray films... Just to your, to your, to your it will be impossible... To, it will be impossible to lift the, the mummy itself. No, I don't think so. No. I see. Well, now, would it be possible for me to take uh, some measurements? Oh, yes. Metric measurements of the face. Good. Thank you very much. Now, as far as the first of the three mummies is concerned, Professor Harrison must restrict his use of an investigative technique called anthropometry. I think if I could get the... the tools may look a bit alarming, but the basic principle of anthropometry is simple enough. An individual is unique. Every person is different from everybody else. And clearly the size of his head and the shape of his head is unique to that person. And so therefore if we measure his head, the distance from front to back and the width and the circumference and so on and many other features that one can measure on a skull then we'll get a clue to the identity of that individual. Wendy, would you note that the, um, the greatest diameter of the skull is 14.4 centimeters? But one's got to remember also that, of course, that one's characteristics are inherited. And so, therefore, uh, we find that a given person has certain characteristics which come from his mother or from his father or both. And uh, in this way, therefore, we can also trace the genetic inheritance of an individual. But as he's not been allowed to disturb Yuya, the professor's measurements are inevitably limited. So he must rely mainly on X-ray. But here, too, there are problems. Uh, 10 centimeters exactly. Fine. Well, I think this is all we can do at this point from the menstruational standpoint. Would it be possible to remove the covering? No, no. So we will have to include that in our x-rays also. You see, this will also appear on our x-rays being made of metal, of course. Yeah. Yes, I see. Yes, of course, so I see. Yes, yes, yes. And I think it's now uh, out over to you to do the x-rays as much as you possibly can. Yes. For the spectators, this means a bit of a lull in the proceedings. But for Alf Burgess, the x-ray technician Professor Harrison has brought with him from Liverpool, this is the start of a three-day love-hate relationship with a 36-year-old x-ray machine. The vintage device is borrowed from Cairo University. And for Alf, it's rather like trying to pilot the right biplane after years on jumbo jets. Still, with a good deal of rewiring and not a little inspired guesswork, he's soon ready to take some test exposures of Yuya. These will be developed in the museum, and then the rest of the plates will be taken back to Liverpool for processing and analysis. Oh, is Flushed from the struggle with the museum darkroom, Alf Burgess emerges triumphant with the test x-rays of Yuya's three and a half thousand year old head. In a solid coffin. And as well as that, we have to get the uh, chemicals, because there's no balance here, we just have to throw them in, you know. <laughs> They're all right though, I think. You can do his measurements from them. Yeah. Ah, a bit chaotic, I think. The doubts are only temporary. The professor approves the tests, Alf can complete his x-rays, and Yuya will soon be able to relax again under his golden lid. For today, the show is over. But for tomorrow's crowd, there'll be another star attraction. The next on the bill is Yuya's wife. <laughs> Once a lady of the court, a Theban priestess and superior of the god's harem, this is Thuyu. But for Professor Harrison, she may have an even more intriguing history, for she may be the grandmother of Tutankhamun. A large amount of original hair, 
the ears are well formed, the lobe of the left one is pierced in two places, and on the right also. A depression of the nose also that one finds in uh, mummies that have been wrapped because the bandages compress the nose quite forcibly. The lips are slightly parted, revealing the teeth. But after the preliminary observations, the professor has more important things on his mind. The museum authorities' extreme caution over Yuya has meant that he's had to do without a vital clue from the first mummy, a piece of tissue from which a blood test can be taken. Instead, he's had to settle for a scrap of Yuya's hair. But today, the professor has more positive designs on the lady. Preferably, we would like a piece of the foot here, you see, because both of the feet are slightly degenerate. Okay. And if we could have just one very small piece of tissue, okay. I'd be very grateful. Thank you very much. The urgent request for body tissue may sound odd, but it's crucial to the success of the investigation. Even a tiny fragment of the mummy may provide an all-important blood sample. Blood groups are inherited, and each individual has his own specific characteristic blood group. So therefore, if people intermarry, then according to the principles of inheritance, one will find that the children will, of course, inherit the blood groups of the parents. And therefore, one is able to map out the family tree by knowing which blood groups are dominant in which parents and which are recessive, and map out which children are derived from which parents. But even at this stage, there's a snag. It isn't bandage, I suppose, is it? It is really tissue. I think so, yes. Thank you very much. From the coffin? No, no, no. Actually, it is bandage. In the litter of remnants on the floor of the coffin, Thuyu's wrappings are almost indistinguishable from the lady herself. So the hunt for a piece of her foot has to begin again. It's not a very likely, but it is a vital clue in tracking down Tutankhamun's mother. If we have the blood groups of Yuya and Thuyu, then we may be able to work out what the blood group of Queen T might have been. While the hunt for tissue goes on, it's perhaps a good moment to recap on precisely who is who at this stage of the investigation. Having first examined Yuya, the professor is now looking at Yuya's wife, Thuyu. The reason for investigating this couple is to get an indirect lead on the blood group of their daughter, Queen T, whose body has never been found. In this way, the professor hopes to be able to decide whether the brothers Tutankhamun and Smenkare, whose blood group he already knows, are in fact the children of Queen T or not. But the whole chain of investigation will break down unless Professor Harrison can get a piece of Thuyu. Thank you very much. Good. That's marvellous. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Well, I hope that this will be big enough for yes. estimating blood groups. <laughs> it's a minute piece of tissue, isn't it? Yes. Mm. All right. Thank you very much. I will be. It's a very, very small piece of tissue, and I'd hoped that perhaps we might have got more. But with the new te technique we've developed, we can extract blood groups fairly efficiently. I'm only hoping that it's going to be sufficiently well refined to be able to do it with this small piece of tissue, too. With the vital and perhaps barely adequate scrap of Thuyu in the bag at last, Professor Harrison can now proceed to his program of measurements and X-rays. There's even a moment today for some reflections on how mummification worked. Well, mummification is essentially, basically, simply a dehydration of tissues. If you look at the tissues here on the face, you can see that because of the fact that the subcutaneous tissue has lost water, the skin has become uh, drawn, almost like parchment, over the underlying bony structure. And in the earliest times, the body was simply buried in the sand and the heat of the sand dried out the body and drove off the water and caused it to dehydrate in this way. But as methods of mummification became more evolved, what happened then was that uh, it was first realized that the intestines and uh, thoracic organs should be removed because when the body was simply buried in the, sta in the sand, they fermented and uh, caused lesions in the skin and sometimes quite a nasty mess. In other words, the putrefying intestine underneath burst out 
through holes in the skin. That's right. Um, and then they realized that one of the basic features was to exclude air from the surface of the body. So that brought in the process of wrapping the body. And they rapidly realized also that uh, putting oil over the surface would stop um, any degenerative procedure. So by the time we get to the 18th dynasty, the process of mummification is very highly evolved. They make an incision in the, in the anterior aspect of the abdomen and pull out the intestines, and then they remove the sternum and remove the heart and the lungs, and then they anoint the body with oil and spices and wrap it up in these mummy bandages. And provided these remain intact, then, of course, the facial features and indeed all bodily features remain unharmed for thousands of years. Seti the first, Ramesses the second, Tutmosis the second. Once it was a roll call of the most powerful men on earth. Now it's a list of the placid occupants of matching glass cases in the Cairo Museum. Many are astonishingly well preserved, some rather the worse for wear. Among the most ravaged is Professor Harrison's final subject, Amenophis the third. But then it seems that he lived a fairly exhausting life. So he, he commanded that these 30 women should be brought from Libya? Yes. Well, uh, from Syria. From Syria. Syria. From Syria, yes. From Syria. yes. Yeah. Wonderful, yes. Well, I don't know whether we will find any... Uh, I don't see now well, in what condition he is. Well, you <laughs> think that this is the answer? Yes, this is the answer. <laughs> Fine. Well, let's have a look, anyway. Yes. Very good. The skull has been damaged to a certain extent, but the most significant feature that is obvious, is the tremendous amount of uh, dental decay. I think, Dr. Ria, that Amenophis III must have suffered very much from his teeth. But his teeth are the least of Amenophis III's problems now. Although Tutankhamun's supposed father is a younger mummy than Professor Harrison's other two subjects, his deterioration, due probably to disturbance by tomb robbers, means that today very little of Amenophis is connected to the rest of him. Here is the sacrum, here is the first rib, here is the radius and ulna, here is the pelvis, or a part of it, and here we have the femur, the head and neck, it is completely detached. But despite the pharaoh's fragmentary state, Professor Harrison hopes to be able to break new ground with Amenophis III. I hope that uh, when we've examined the x-rays of Amenophis III, we'll get a good idea as to the age he was when he died. The Egyptologists aren't quite clear about that at the moment. The examination by means of x-rays and the measurements and so on that we've taken will help very considerably in this respect. Is the x-ray machine working now? In fact, the veteran x-ray machine has finally passed on to its own afterlife. For the present, the professor has to make do with measuring Amenophis. So, with so many spare parts of the pharaoh lying around, there is at least no problem this time about securing a piece of tissue for blood analysis. Yeah. Ah, yes. What? Do we have both of those? Yes? One or These two, the, the both. These two. Yes? Oh, I'm very reasonably satisfied with the way things have gone. However, so far, there have been one or two snags. Our X-ray machine packed up yesterday morning, and uh, you will recall that when we wanted to take pieces of tissue from Yuya and to you, we were only ab able to obtain minute fractions of tissue. Whether these will be enough for us to, de to determine the blood groups, I don't know. And, of course, the success of any investigation of this sort will depend on the completeness of the results. And these we'll only be able to assess when we get back to England. Liverpool University on a wet Monday morning. Despite the weather, it seems the investigation is looking up. A parcel, recently arrived from Cairo, has supplied the missing evidence. And as he starts the last lap of his investigation, Professor Harrison has good reason to be optimistic. Fortunately, within the last few days, uh, we received the x-rays of Amenophis III and a minute piece of tissue from Yuya. So now we are able to complete the investigation. 
the X-ray of Tutankhamun himself, taken on the 1968 expedition. The professor is soon able to establish close connections between his distinctive skull shape and that of his father, now confirmed as Amenophis III on the new X-rays. Yuya, on the other hand, lacking the unique silhouette of the pharaohs, is, as expected, not one of this royal family. He is certainly not of the same uh, line of descendancy as the others that we've been looking at. You can see from the shape of his, of his skull that it's quite different from that of Amenophis III, um, Tutankhamun and Smenkare. But as far as the uh, relationship of Yuya and Suyu to Tutankhamun, you've got to rely on other evidence than oh, X-ray. Yes. yes, certainly. Um, what we think is that Yuya and Suyu were the parents of Queen Tyre who was the wife of Amenophis III. And therefore, we can only get an estimate as to the place Yuya and Thuyu have in the family tree by looking at their blood groups and seeing how they will fit into the blood groups of Tutankhamun and Smenkare that we know of already. This is where Robert Connolly joins the search for Tutankhamun's mother. Using techniques he's perfected on a less precious second-hand mummy owned by the university, Connell is able to work out the blood groups of long, bloodless pharaohs. I mean, what is mind-boggling to, to people who don't know anything about this is how you could possibly work out a blood group from a tiny fragment of 3,000-year-old dried-up tissue anyway. Well, the first point about this is that people often get the impression that we are actually looking at the remains of the blood from these ancient tissues. This is not actually what we do. When Professor Harrison comes back with his little pomadine mm. bag from yeah. Cairo, with a little bit of Suyu or Yuya, whoever it is in it, um, what do you start doing to it? What we're really doing, we're collecting the old blood group substances and changing the blood group of modern red cells and finding out then how the modern red cells have changed. This is basically what we do. So, by fixing Yuya's blood chemicals onto his own red cells, Connolly can take the investigation one stage further. In the test tube, his own blood will take on the characteristics of a man who died three and a half thousand years ago. It's a bit eerie, isn't it? No, I don't really think of it like that. Some people often ask me if I object to working late at night with chaps like this around the room, <laughs> and it doesn't really worry me, no. But for all his unflappability, Connolly has uncovered some really striking evidence in the search for Tutankhamun's mother. It seems that there are two decisive components in Tutankhamun's blood. One of these came from Amenophis, his father, though the other one must have come from his mother. We now know what her blood group must be, and Connolly's tests have shown that Queen T could well qualify. Although her body has never been found, from the minute samples of her parents, Yuya and Suyu, he's traced the Queen's blood group and he's shown that that essential and somewhat rare component must have flowed in her veins. It's not proof positive that Queen T was Tut's mother, but it does make her an odds-on favorite. And in a branch of investigation which can seldom enjoy the uncluttered certainties of a Barlow or an Ironside, Professor Harrison can feel well satisfied. So that means that it is at least possible and possibly likely that the missing Queen Taye was Tutankhamun's mother. Oh, yes. That right. Certainly, it's within the bounds of probability, certainly. In the end, of course, the real star of the investigation is Tutankhamun himself. After three and a half thousand years in his tomb and 50 years out of it, he's still generating mysteries, investigations and television programs. One way or another, the immortality he was prepared for seems to be holding up pretty well. <laughs>